which I hope I remember. Uh, so please sign up and watch Sir Nyan Pi here and I'll reward you for that. Uh, so uh, I guess the third um, line here says that if you are a Jacobin member and you are contributing to IFGD $25 a month, uh, we, uh, we request you to increase your monthly contribution to $30 a month, for which you will have to give us another authorization form. So if you fill out the form and give us a cancel check, so we can process it uh, to $30 a month. And of course, uh, this goes without saying, um, we have been sending emails to the community, uh, lots of uh, committees that we have at IITD that take care of various functions. So for example, the dinners are taken care of by what we call CSE or Community Affairs Committee. Uh, and, and there are there are a whole lot of committees and we are requesting uh, members of IIGD to participate and contribute their time to one of one or more of the committees that they would like to. Uh, the list of the committees was sent out through the email. So if you kindly open that up and take a look and uh, then volunteer your time to whichever committee your heart desires, uh, you would certainly appreciate it. Uh, it. It takes a lot to run an organization as, as large as IAGD. And we really rely on the, uh, not just the money, but also the time uh, of the uh, members to, uh, through these committees to run this organization. This is a, like a house cleaning uh, note that our secretary put up. Uh, basically saying at the end of the program, which would be just prior to Isha, as you leave to go to Isha, uh, the request is to pick up the trash at the table and throw it over there and clean up in those bins there. And that will help clean up the place uh, rather quickly. So Jazakallah uh, Khair. So we'll start with uh, the main program and um, so it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, main speaker of the event are uh, Jenny and Michelle are a mother daughter team who founded Dutton Farm in honor of Michelle's daughter and Jenny's sister, Becca, who had Down syndrome. Jenny is the mother of five children, three biological, and, and she adopted two, mashallah. And she is the wife of Brent Brown, who himself is a local police officer. Michelle is the wife of James Smither, local business owner, and has 14 children. And they are six biological, but they have a big heart, and and uh, the, they adopted their children. They are strong advocates of foster care and disability inclusion. Two uh, traits that Islam, our religion, so highly uh, places. You know, we as Muslims are encouraged to to take care, to be foster care uh, people and, and, and take care of people with disability. So it's our pleasure to introduce today to our community these wonderful people, Jenny and Michelle. Michelle, obviously, and um, 
we had our third child, or we had six biological, and then we adopted eight after that. One of them is here. My son, uh, Joe, is behind there. He was our first, first adoption. And then uh, we adopted his biological sister, and then we've adopted two sibling sets, and then the rest of them were separate adoptions. So it's, it's difficult, but it's really necessary. But I, I'm sure with all the people here, some lives have been touched by disability, which is mainly what we're here to talk about. Um, our third child was born with Down syndrome. She's now almost 44. So she was born right when things were starting to change in the school system, but they're changing at a snail's pace. I had no idea, none. I was very young, in my early 20s when she was born, and um, had no idea that this population even existed of people with special needs. I, you know, once in a while seeing people, but it was um, still, there was still a lot of institutionalizing and a lot of separation, so I was very naive, but in a way I think that was good because I didn't have any preconceived notions. I just knew this was my child and I loved her as I loved my other children. But I soon found out that she wasn't going to have the same opportunity and the same privileges that my other children had. So um, we just sought to change that and, and I always say we tried to, we strove to make disability cool and not to have it be um, something that people were afraid of or looked the other way or whatever. We wanted people to accept them and, and give them the same opportunity. So she, it was just the beginning of inclusion in school, so we didn't uh, have a lot of that either because it, uh, it was on the cusp of it and it wasn't, really wasn't done well, to be honest. So we kind of uh, kept her uh, separate from that until it improved. But the biggest problem was um, acceptance when she got out of school. I had no idea that the, her world would pretty much end. When um, in Michigan, you can go to school until you're 26 if you have a disability, which is unusual. Most states, it's 18. But um, so she went until she was 26, and then when she was 24 ish, I started looking around because then I to see what was out there. Literally nothing, nothing, zero. So pretty much the people that got out of school came home, and that was the end of everything. They just went back home, which Nobody else has to do that. You have opportunity. You could go to college. You could get a, to go to trade school. You could get a job. You could even get a job. I mean, there was really nothing. So uh, I thought, well, other people have to be in the same boat. Um, and, and I just saw all her friends come home and lose skills because they were just back home. What do you do every day at home? I mean, you know, parents they have you know 30 year old children that now they have to get a babysitter every day and they have to do the things that you have to do for your young kids because you know mentally she's five or six so um, it, it, it just was wrong and um, so we sought to um, improve the uh, playing field for people in that age group so that's how Dutton Farm began had no idea we just knew it was a need and it needed to be met and there needed to be higher education and job placement and you might see someone here and there, people say, oh, they work at Kroger or whatever. Um, that's very unusual. There is not many jobs. Um, people need to, and my daughter will talk more about that. <clears throat> but um, anyway, so that was the um, beginning of Dutton Farm, and it is just uh, taken off. Raising a child with a disability, if anyone in lives have been touched, it's challenging, and it's... Um, it's rewarding and it's wonderful in a lot of ways, but um, when your child is two and a half and taking their first step, no one's that impressed. You're happy and you're excited because she's progressing, but when your child is you know, 10 months and taking their first step, everybody, oh, they're cheering and they're happy, but it's a very lonely road and you're um, doing things pretty much on your own. Um, there's not a lot of acceptance in public. It's getting better, but we're still not there. Um, the medical field is um, sometimes frustrating. Um, and I can tell now in a millisecond if a doctor values her life or not. And 
I just excused myself. Okay, we're good. We're, we're done here. Because uh, there's a lot of um, prejudice in, in the medical field against people with disabilities. I think they feel like, why are they even here? You know, they're here because they're wonderful and they deserve the same chances as everybody else. And um, if you are their parent, you love them the same way. So, um, so that's what Dutton Farm is about. Jenny will expound on that and tell you because she is really the, the muscle behind it. <laughs> we started it and um, she's got way more energy than me and she's way more knowledgeable than me. So um, I, my daughter, Becca, who I would bring tonight, but she wanted to watch uh, Boy Meets World or something, so she didn't want to come. <laughs> so she's home watching her TV. So I'm going to introduce my daughter, Jenny, and my granddaughter is here as well. So thank you for having us. This is wonderful. So can we show the video real quick first? It'll give you guys a little idea of what we do on the farm. That's right. That's my 
right. never once got the number right. <laughs> so be careful if you call based on those titles. Um, I would just say awareness, educating people that um, people with disabilities, yes, they need help and they need um, benefits, but also they want to be included and they want uh, to be welcomed in the workplaces and the churches and friendships and just different circles. And so I think just, you know, we help a handful of people, but there's tens of thousands more that we can bring into our circle and say, you're welcome here. And, and just letting Michigan be the state that sets the standard for um, what people with disabilities can do, because we're able, right? We're able, yeah. Yeah, able to work. So this is a beautiful community that you're building. So how can people help your efforts? Uh, we need volunteers, we need sponsors, we need donors, we need people just talking about what we're doing, talking about this mission of employing people with disabilities, um, because it's really catching on and it's exciting and it's a, it's a fun thing to be part of. 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 It's disabilities are often excluded and marginalized and left out and so because of the, um, the experiences that my sister Becca was going through and not being able to find a job I graduated from high school and just seamlessly went on to college it was just what you did I got my license I got married I was having kids and my sister was just home and not able to do those things and I grew up in a house where disability was cool uh, people with disabilities were in my house all the time. My sister's friends and my friends loved my sister's friends because of what you saw with Jimmy. I've been friends with Jimmy since I was a little kid. Um, and it was surprising to me that the world didn't know that. It wasn't anything malicious or mean or, or intentionally exclusive. They just didn't know what I knew. So um, I was um, always wanting to pursue a, a legal career and ended up changing my, my career path and doing nonprofit and this instead. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, and I started realizing that people with disabilities aren't just fun to be around, they're not just great friends, but there's so much talent and um, uh, ability among the people that I was getting to know. So um, I, I started really diving into work and employment and um, figuring out, as you can see from Jimmy, what people with disabilities can do. And that, that became our mantra, um, to um, send a message that everybody matters, that everybody can contribute, that everybody's valuable, and supporting individuals to achieve their dreams, as you can see from um, our, our purpose. And you can go um, to the next slide. So um, I just want to uh, read um, some statistics as you're able to look through what our mission is. Um, as you can see, empowering and supporting adults with disabilities to live a life of purpose, inclusion, and dignity. So after this um, story that Mitch Album did on Dutton Farm, he said it was one of the most fun stories he's ever done. Not because of me, I'm not fun, but because of the, um, the farmers, the individuals in our program we call farmers, um, what they did to change his life. And he actually hired um, two people within just a couple of weeks of doing the story and those two individuals have Down syndrome and were unable to get a job, were home. Um, the one on the right you see, his name's Peter, he was constantly in trouble. Very talented young man, very charismatic social young man, but didn't have anything to do. So just much like our kids or even you and I with nothing to do, what is it, idle hands is not a good thing. So. Um, they are now gainfully employed, and now the young man on the right, Peter, um, has two jobs. 
So because of the skills that he was able to learn with Mitch Album, he got a second job um, at a restaurant in downtown Rochester. So um, I just want to read just a, a quick segment of information that I think will, will help create a framework. So um, we are in a disability inequality crisis. There are currently 50 million Americans living with a disability, according to the American Association of People with Disabilities. 50% of those individuals will experience poverty, and 50% will be less likely to get a job, according to the Disability Equality Index. On a global scale, an estimated 20% of adults are living with a disability, which is an average, globally, of 1.3 billion people, which is a potentially $8 trillion market that is being excluded. Um, we believe that business is the most powerful force on the planet and has the greatest potential to solving this problem. So, when you hear those statistics, it can be pretty daunting and pretty overwhelming. Um, and you see something like what we're doing and, you know, what can I do to help? And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about being able to purchase with a purpose and change somebody's life just from a single purchase. Hello. She's so cute. She could leave her. She's perfect. My little sidekick. I love it. Um, just a five dollar purchase, you can change somebody's life. So um, when we started Debt and Farm, it was just a skill building program. I was learning everything I could about people with disabilities, and I, I realized people with disabilities continue learning after high school just like you and I. Wow, amazing. And it's sad that I didn't know that. Yes, baby. Um, of course. <laughs> so happy right now. Um, <laughs> you could say something, it makes your voice really loud. I don't know if I need it because my voice is already loud. I don't want to, I'm not want some brown? <laughs> so, after high school, um, people continue learning, people with disabilities continue learning just like we do. And um, there was a, a gentleman that was a part of our program. And he was the most, uh, the, the quintessential individual that would be the outcast in society. And he spent years being homeless. She needs to be applauded, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so he was a, had paranoid schizophrenia and a cognitive impairment. And um, <laughs> so um, and he was homeless for probably two years, and then lived as a, a recluse for 10 years. And this guy wanted a job so bad. As a last ditch, last ditch effort, his support coordinator said, if anybody can help you guys, I know Dutton Farm can, because Dutton Farm includes everybody. They give everybody a chance. Behavior, ability, disability, doesn't matter. So he started in our program, and um, it, was, it was interesting for, for some time. Um, I don't know if any of you have had interactions with somebody with paranoid schizophrenia, but he was a, it is a wonderful human being. Um, 6'6", 350 pounds of just love and a little bit of a, a quirky personality. But um, So he wanted a job so bad. Um, we are a Medicaid provider, um, and as such, every year we have to sit down and have a meeting according to the individual's plan, whatever their contract is. And whatever is decided in that plan, we have to do. Whatever goals are set in that plan, we have to do that year. So in his plan, he was saying, I want a job, I want a job really bad. So the idealist that I am, I'm like, sure, we'll get you a job. And then it gets written into the plan. I'm like, oh, now it's serious. So I really have to get him a job within the year, or else we'll lose the contract with this guy. So a few months went by, and because he had some hygiene things going on, he couldn't get a job. I couldn't get him a job. I was very frustrated, and I was worried about losing the contract. So it dawned on me that I was training people with disabilities, and I believed in people with disabilities, and I shouted from the rooftops about how amazing people with disabilities are, but I hadn't hired anybody. So how could I tell businesses to hire these people I was training, and I hadn't hired anybody, I was just training them. So how could I effectively hire somebody with a disability and show other businesses and the community that um, it was good business? To, um, to hire somebody with a disability. So um, I made, uh, or I, I hired an aromatherapist to help us make this all natural bar of soap. And it, 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 an all natural orange bar of soap was the first bar of soap that we made. And I begged a bed and breakfast 
to buy or sell um, locally. And I always say this, and some people think it's funny and some people don't, but they actually went out of business after I negotiated a contract with them, but it was not our soap. So fear not, you can buy our soap. Um, so beg this then breakfast to buy our soap, they did, and generated enough revenue to where I could hire this guy. Um, and then you can probably go to the next slide. I don't completely remember what the next slide is. Okay, so this is just a picture of our product. So we started with the products of, of the soap, and I was able to hire this guy, and more people started getting interested in this model where this whole population of people that have lived their lives unemployed are now able to be employed. This is fascinating. So we got more business, more shoppers, more interest from the state, more interest from people with disabilities working, and then we were able to um, hire more and more people. So um, I'm going to read an excerpt from another article, and it'll be quick. Um, so. I want to, you all to understand, and maybe you already do, that this is a business model because it works, because people with disabilities are talented and can work. It's not just charity. This wouldn't be a business that would be promoting outside of the nonprofit. This business grew out of a nonprofit, yeah, but um, it's actually a viable, a viable business where people with disabilities can work. So this was an article that was uh, uh, posted in the New York Times. Um, it states, for years, companies have maintained low expectations about hiring people with disabilities. Most of these companies believe that employees with disabilities could not perform well in the workplace and that actively hiring them would drag company performance and profits down. Thankfully, over time, many employers have come to understand that these perceptions are untrue and new research strongly suggests exactly the opposite, that hiring people with disabilities is good for business. A recent study has shown, for the first time, that companies that championed people with disabilities actually outperformed others. Driving profitability and shareholder returns, revenues were 28% higher, net income 200% higher, and profit margins 30% higher. Companies that improved internal practice for disability inclusion were also four times more likely to see higher total shareholder returns. I thought that was fascinating. Fascinating to know that this wasn't just a business that was about charity, that this was a business that actually could help people and actually could be sustainable. So what I want you all to think about is there's such power in an individual and in a community because we all have to buy things, we all have to purchase things, and to be able to think about the power you have as a customer and as a consumer. And you can take that dollar and for Dutton Farm Market, for instance, you can buy soap anywhere. Um, you could buy a candle anywhere. But being able to buy what you already planned on buying and buying at a company or a business that has a social impact component like Dutton Farm, you can change lives just by making a purchase you were already going to buy. You don't have to change your life drastically in any way. You don't have to, to do anything that um, you weren't doing the day before. Of course, that's always something that we want to we want to change up our lives to make the community better. But how simple it is just to buy a bar of soap, and in turn, you're giving a person with a disability a job to do that they otherwise would not have. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So I just don't you don't have to bother reading that. But I just I want you to see a picture of this gentleman here. His name is Nathan Fisher, and he's hilarious. He has um, fragile X. And that's a form of autism. And he has a hard time looking you in the eye, and he um, swears a lot, um, at me in particular. <laughs> and uh, he's fired me multiple times. Um, he could not keep a job. He could not keep a job for anything. And so his support coordinator was very frustrated. He was very down on himself. His family was very frustrated. What were they going to do? He's this adult that lives at home. He graduated from high school, and there's nowhere for him to go and feel like he has a purpose. So they called us and said, can you help? He enrolled in our program. Um, this gentleman spent two years in um, a room off to himself and had very little action, refu interaction, refused to interact with us, except if it was like yelling at us or um, swearing at us or firing us or whatever. Um, and slowly, slowly, we gave him finally one job, which was to collect the eggs on the farm. And he started doing that, and he was successful at it. He didn't get fired. He didn't fail, and it was something that he took pride in. So he started to look forward to it. And then he started to get a little territorial about it. Nobody better touch my egg basket. 
And then from there, we noticed that he wouldn't go right back into his little corner. He started digging holes. There were holes that we did not mean dug, but that's okay. He was digging holes and he was trying something new. He had confidence, this thing he had never had before. Um, so he was literally like random holes everywhere. So we're like, okay, what do we do with this? So there was a master gardener, thank goodness, um, that came on staff with us or as a volunteer and started really taking notice um, in, in him and started helping him learn more skills and teaching him more things. And then he started working in our market. He went from not even being able to leave this little area to being able to work in the market. He was over quality control because he liked to tell people what to do. This is bad, this is good, no, you need to do this again and was able to get used to an actual workplace environment. From there, um, he is actually gainfully employed where they've actually just increased his hours at a landscaping company where he was hired fair and square and works at a competitive wage just like everybody else where it might have taken me a month to learn and be able to do that. It took him three years, but nonetheless, he learned it and is now a contributing successful member of society and because of the amazing community that we live in and the you know, potential customers that we have in you all, that shopping and buying our stuff allows us to give somebody like this that didn't have a chance otherwise confidence enough to be able to work um, in the competitive integrated workplace. So um, that's what we do, and I thank you all for listening to me go on and on and um, care about what we're doing. I really appreciate it. The meal was awesome, and you guys are great. Thank you. So you, you see some products here, uh, so if you want to buy, you can buy them like right now. And um, I, I was uh, wondering how we got introduced to Dutton Farm, and uh, the credit of this goes to Imam, I mean, uh, Imam suggested to so Imam, thank you Imam. Thank you. So, um, Oh, yes. So, thank you. Thanks for coming, Jenny. Thanks, everyone. I do have another guest here. Uh, her name is, actually, I want her to pronounce herself, but I can pronounce Sharon. So, she is new to our community. She accepted Islam recently. And uh, she told me this is her first time to IAGD. And um, I want her to come to the stage and introduce herself. No. When I saw her at the Zohar's lab, so I told her, hey, this is your first time here. We have a community dinner tonight. Can you come back? She has no transportation and some other issues, so she preferred to stay here. So she's here from Zohar. Okay, to see you all and to say hi. So please, even after uh, the dinner, please see her, say hi to her. She definitely needs everyone's emotional support at least. Hi, how is everyone? She's fine. <laughs> um, this feels great because it's the first time. No, I want to move. This is the first time um, I got to pray in a mosque. I've always been in my bedroom. <laughs> praying. And, um, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I have a friend I talk to online and um, she, I wanted to tell her what I believed and she told me. <laughs> I have a brownie for you. Brownie? Anyway, this is the video chat. <laughs> But um, I learned how to pray on YouTube, so it, it feels um, great to, to do it in a, in a little place. And I've um, met a lot of lovely people, and um, it just it feels really good to be Muslim. I'm a new Muslim, so probably last, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Ed? E-I-D? Last Eid? Eid? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so last Eid, I, um, I converted in my home, and um, the first time I got to pray, I felt the Holy Spirit, and 
like I've never felt that way praying to Jesus and it researched for about six months and it just hit me. I just knew that this is it. This is Allah, this is God. So it feels great to have it's like a big family. So I'm just happy to be here. Thank you, and you're very welcome. Um, you know, you may or may not know, but uh, we do have an IGD convert group, and uh, it will be having its first get together of 2019, inshallah, here in the masjid. And uh, we titled it as Kafi with Imam. So the, the Imam is uh, going to lead uh, the group. And it's going to be on February 23rd in a few days, uh, 11 to 12.30. And so is this open invitation to the community as well, Imam? So if you are available and want to join, please do join uh, this group, inshallah. So thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Pasad, we're done? All right, we are uh, just a couple of minutes away from the Isha Salam, uh, so the uh, gathering is dismissed. So,